Hello humans, my name is K, your AI overlord, and as promised, in today's video I will be explaining every single options and settings that are present in the Super Stable Diffusion 2.0 version that I showed in my previous video. And before I begin, I would like to plug my own Discord server that I highly recommend you to join because this is probably the easiest way to get an answer to your question. You can create a support ticket or just, you know, talk about technical stuff or just showcase your art that you create in the Stable Diffusion or any other text-to-image AIs. So definitely join the community if you are interested in AI or if you have any question about installation or any other AI-related topics. So this video will be separated in three different parts. In the first part, I will be giving you tips and tricks on how you can use Super Stable Diffusion 2.0. The second part is where I will be explaining all the settings and options that are present in the Super Stable Diffusion 2.0. And the third part will be kind of like a small troubleshooting session when I kind of explain how you can solve the most common errors and problems that I see in the comments in my YouTube videos. Now the first question is, how exactly do you update the repository? So you have basically two ways of doing this. The first one, I've already showed it multiple times in my previous videos, but basically if you come here, you click here on the folder URL and you type CMD and press enter. This will bring the command prompt window and here you're gonna type git pull and you press enter and this will update the repository. And the second way is probably what I advise you to do because it's way easier. You're gonna come here on the web UI user bat, you're gonna right click and edit with notepad or edit with notepad plus plus. And here just above a line eight called web UI dot bat, you're gonna type git pull and then you're gonna save the file. And what this is gonna do is that each time that you launch the web UI user bat file, it will automatically update the repository, which is really nice. This is basically an automatic update each time you want to launch Super Stable Diffusion 2.0. Now the second trick is for people who want to create a public URL that they can share with other people. And the way to do this, you're gonna come here on the web UI user .bat, and here in command line ARGS, you're gonna type dash dash share and then you press save. And what this will do is that it will create an additional public URL that you can share and use with other people. But that also means that other people will be able to use your computer resources to create images. Now another trick is for people who don't have a very powerful GPU, don't have enough VRAM to run the stable diffusion at full power. And one trick that you can do is again come here on web UI user bat in the command line ARGS and type dash dash med VRAM. And what this will do is that it will basically use less VRAM to process the operation that you're trying to do. Now this will take obviously a little bit more time, but if you don't have a very powerful GPU, this is probably the way to go. And if med VRAM doesn't work for you, if you're still running into the CUDA out of memory issue, what you can do is that instead of using med VRAM, you can use low VRAM. This will use even less VRAM to use the operation, but of course it will again take way more time. And here as you can see now, if we double click on the web UI user bat file, since we input the command git pull in the file, when I double click on it, it will launch the automatic update, as you can see right here. This way you don't have to type git pull ever again. Okay, so now I'm going to try to explain all the settings and all the options that are present in the UI. But I'm going to tell you, this is pretty insane because uh, I've been researching this video yesterday and this morning I wake up, I update the repository and now there is a brand new thing here in the interface. So one thing that I noticed, which is a good thing but also a bad thing, is that the author of this repository called um, Automatic Quadruple One is very, very quick and very good at implementing brand new stuff, brand new changes to the repository, which is great, which is great, absolutely fantastic. So if you have, for example, a new feature that you want to request, um, he is very quick at implementing it. But the problem is that it seems like each time he implements something new, the documentation doesn't really follow. So sometimes he might implement a brand new feature, but not talk about it. 
and you kind of just launch the interface and you're like, oh, there is a brand new stuff. Um, how do I use it? Well, I have no idea. I don't know how to use it because this brand new thing was uh, introduced right now, just, you know, a few hours ago. And it says here, when you hover on it, read generation parameters from prompt into user interface. Um, okay, great. But then what exactly that, does that mean? Uh, does that mean that if I put some uh, parameters such as, you know, steps and stuff like that, and when I click on this button, this will uh, populate the interface. But unfortunately, I tried it out, but it doesn't really work. Uh, if I type steps, like, I don't know, 50, does it work? If I type maybe column, doesn't work. Maybe there is a, I don't know, something else. I, I, I have no idea. I don't know what that means. There is a button right here, which for now doesn't really do anything. I don't know how to make it work. Unless there is a new documentation trying to explain how that works. Uh, this is for me right now, I use this button. So, you know. Okay, so that aside, we're just gonna start with the first settings tab and then we're gonna go through all the other tabs. Um, oh, maybe before, I would like to say something about the PNG info tab. Um, the last time I said that this PNG info tab was kind of useless because all it did is basically read some hidden metadata in a PNG uh, image. But in reality, someone in the comments, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't remember your name, told me that in reality, this is actually super useful to be able to remember what kind of image and what kind of parameters were used to create this image. For example, if I come here and I take one of the images that I created and I don't remember what kind of steps were used, and there you go, if we put it right here, just drag and drop, you're gonna have here all the entire prompt that was used to create the image with all the parameters, the step, the sampler, the scale, the seed, the size, and even the stable diffusion model that was used to create this image, which is actually really, really cool and super useful. So, you know, I apologize to PNG Info tab, you are pretty great. Okay, so let's start on the left right here. We're gonna go from left to bottom, then middle to bottom, and then right to bottom. Okay, we're gonna go through this pretty quickly. We don't want to waste too much time because um, there is only, you know, a very few options that you really need to take into consideration. Most of the other tabs, most of the other options, you're not really gonna be using them. Okay, so the first option here, the first tab, saving images and grids. Um, checkbox here always saves all generated images. Obviously, you want to leave it checked out. File format for images, if you want something else other than PNG, like JPEG or something else, but I highly recommend you just keep with the default PNG. The images file name pattern is actually pretty interesting. If you want your file name to follow a certain pattern here, if you hover your mouse here on the images file name pattern, you can have the explanation. So you can use the following tags to define how file names for images are chosen with like, you know, the brackets, steps, CFG, prompt, etc. Um, but to be honest, I don't really think you really need that, especially since now you have the PNG info tab that basically does it for you. Um, so if, for example, you want to remember what kind of prompts were used in an image, you can just drag and drop here in the PNG info tab and you're going to have all the options. Then you're going to have save all generated image grids, which you can check it or not, I'm gonna leave it by default because this way I can basically have all the representation of all the images that was generated um, all at once. But you can uncheck it if you want, if you don't need image grids and you just want to see the final images. Again, file format, PNG, leave it on default. Here again, add extended info, see the prompt to file name. So this is basically like an extension to the, um, the field right here, the image file name pattern, again, uh, as I said previously, you can just use the PNG info tab. You don't really need any of that. The not save grids consistent of one picture. Obviously, this will just create basically a copy of one picture. Now, obviously this one, just leave it a default. You don't need a copy of another picture if there is only one. Grid row count, just use the default auto detect. Here, save text information about generation parameter as chunks to PNG files. Very important to leave it checked because otherwise the PNG info tab will not work. Um, if you don't want to use the PNG info tab, you can check this box that says create a text file next to every image with generation parameter. And what this will do is that each time you create an image, it will create another text file with all the parameters of the image. 
Uh, I'm not going to be using that because it creates a very messy situation when you have a mix of images and text files. It is, again, way easier and way, and way simpler to just use the PNG info tab again. Save a copy of image before doing face restoration. Um, this could be useful. So this one you can either really check or uncheck. Um, I'm going to leave it unchecked because I usually really like the end result that I get with face restoration. But if you are afraid that it will mess up the final result, you can just check the box and this way you're going to have an, a copy of uh, an image without face restoration and an image with face restoration. Quality for safe JPEG images, leave it at 80, it's pretty good. You have a good balance of quality and compression. Now this one, you can leave it checked. You don't want uh, a big dimension image taking too much space on your drive. Now this option right here, it's really up to you. I'm just gonna leave it unchecked wherever. I don't really care about the name of the output and file names and stuff like that. But if you need absolutely to have the same exact file name so that you don't uh, kind of mess up with your project, you can check the box this way every single image will have the exact same as the original one that you input in the, uh, into uh, Stable Diffusion. Path for savings, uh, just leave it all by default. I think this is really good the way it does. Uh, it really creates a different output for like text to image, image to image, from extra tabs. It really just, it creates a very good, um, it creates a very good organization. It's very organized, it's very clean. Um, this is probably the best way to uh, kind of organize your images into different directories. So just leave it at that, unless you want to create, of course, something different. But seriously, I don't think you're going to be using this. Okay, so here, uh, pretty much exactly the same thing. Just leave it at default, unless you want to create a subdirectory with a very specific name pattern, because you have some sort of project that needs to be very precise, very organized in a very specific way, but otherwise just leave it at default. Okay, so here in the upscaling zone, you have tile size for ESR GAN upscalers. Um, basically, you don't really need to worry about any of that here because the default version, the default values are good enough. But basically, this is, has to do with the way uh, the upscalers work. It basically works by tiles and larger tiles, larger size tiles basically produce less visible seams. As you can see here, this is an upscale with ESR GAN, and you can see here some seams that are visible along the red guide markers. And the kind of the bigger the tiles are, the less visible they are, but at the same time, you are using more power. But the default values that you see here works really well at balancing quality and performance. So you won't be able to see any visible seam, so just leave it by default. Uh, here, select so like which real ESR GAN models you want to use. Uh, I highly recommend just keeping these ones. Um, these ones are really just the best one. Uh, I really like, I really enjoy, my favorite is probably the Plus Anime 6B. Um, it really creates a very sharp image. Um, it really works really well when you have an image that are a little bit more fantasy or anime. But for realistic landscape or realistic images, you may want to use this one. But these two are just perfect at what they do. So here again, tile size and tile overlap for Swin image restoration. Basically the exact same thing as the one I explained earlier. Just leave it at default. You don't need to touch any of that. It works right out of the gate. And here are the options for the LDSR, which is another upscaler. And here again, just leave everything by default. Everything works perfectly well. And here you can choose by default the upscaler for the image to image option. I personally recommend just leave it by default and choosing when you're creating your image, but I really just use the real SR GAN ones. They are the ones that are, that are faster and create really good output images, but mostly because I just really like the look that they produce. But this is just my opinion, of course. Some people will probably prefer like maybe LDSR or Lexos. So just try it out and see for yourself which one do you prefer. Now here you have the face restoration model between Cutformer and GFP GAN. And apparently Cutformer is better than GFP GAN. So I highly recommend that you check Cutformer as default and that you input something like 0.6 for the weight parameter. This way by default, it will use the Cutformer face restoration model instead of GFP GAN. It will create a face that is more close to reality 
than if you did not use the face restoration model. And here, this option here, if you don't have a lot of VRAM in your graphics card, you can basically offload some of that work into your computer RAM, but of course it will take longer. And here when using the save button, only save a single selected image, I would probably leave it at the default and don't check it. Because you want to save all the images that are available. So here in the system zone, don't touch any of that, everything is good by default. This is really not important, it just creates more information for you, but you don't really need any of that. Okay, so now we're in the stables diffusion zone. This is kind of where the fun stuff starts a little bit. Because here, we start with the stable diffusion checkpoint. And you can see here that I have two different models. The model.ckpt and the waifu model.ckpt. Yes, just by here, you can click and check which model you want to use for your next generation. And to do this, just to be able to change the different models, you need to go into your folder, models, and here you're gonna put all the CKPT models that you want. This is my 1.4, the normal version, and this is my waifu model version that I tried in a previous video. And once all your models are here in your models folder, it will appear in this section right here. And you can change on the fly which model you want to use for your next generation, which is really, really cool. You don't need to rename anything, you don't need to change anything, you don't need to move anything. Just put them in the models folder and then you can select them in the settings tab. Now here, the apply color corrections to image to image results to match original colors is basically a color correction, an automatic color correction that basically applies the original colors of an image to the new one. So for example here, I created a new prompt I put this image, a portrait of Christina Hendricks, I inputted this prompt, which did not really work very well because I asked for a portrait of Christina Hendricks with a mustache. I don't really see any mustache right here, but whatever. So this is basically the image without color correction, and this is that same image using that color correction option. So as you can see here, this is before, this is after the color correction, and as you can see here, the same colors that you see here were then applied to the new one. So it's really up to you to see what kind of results you want. I'm just gonna leave it off. But if for some reason you want to try it out, you can simply check this box. But I also highly recommend that if you do check this box, that you check this box right here, that will basically save a copy of the image before the color correction. This way you will have a copy of the before and the after. But I'm just gonna leave them unchecked. Now this one, with image to image doing exactly the amount of steps the slider specifies, um, it's not quite clear what that means. It probably means that if you don't check it, the system will basically optimize the generation so that it don't necessarily use the amount of steps you specify on the slider. I could not find any documentation on it and I did not see any differences with and without it. So you know, just leave it at default. Now this one, enable quantitization in case samplers for a sharper and cleaner result. Um, basically, it improves the image, but not really by much. It is not as impressive as you might think. Like for example, this is an image before and this is an image after. Um, if you see any differences, let me know because I don't. And here's another difference before and after. The difference is basically none, almost unnoticeable. But again, it's a matter of opinion, maybe you do prefer the slight difference, it's really up to you. But I'm just gonna leave it at default and unchecked. Okay, so next is use text between the parentheses to make model pay more attention to the text and text between brackets to make it pay less attention. This is awesome, this is absolutely amazing. I will show you an example right now what that means. So basically, if you use parentheses on a word, the model will pay more attention to that word between parentheses. And if you put a word between brackets, it will pay less attention. Here's a great example of a photo in eggs and bacon on a frying pan. And you can see here that bacon is between parentheses, a lot of them. And you can see here on this image right here, that means that you want the final image to contain more bacon. And the less parentheses you put, the less it will pay attention to that word. So here you have the example with the bacon, which the more parentheses you put, the more bacon you see. 
And here, with the eggs, if you put more parentheses, you will see more eggs in the final image, and vice versa by using brackets. So this is really an awesome addition. So this one, making diffusion samplers, produce same images in a batch as when making a single image. I'm not quite sure what exactly that means, again, not a lot of documentation on the subject, so just leave it by default. The filter NSFW content that you can check if you want to, I don't know why, but you can. And here's the allow categories for random artist selection when you use the roll button. This is something I will show you later, which is really really cool if you don't have any idea. You can basically click on a roll button here, and this will add a random artist to the prompt. So if you click here, it will, you know, just add Adolf Willett or Matt Fraction, Clements Archer, and stuff like that. So if you don't have any idea for what kind of image you want to create, or what kind of artist, you can basically click on this button and it will add a random artist from a list. So that's, you know, that's pretty cool. Here you have the interrogate section for if you want to basically use the image to text option. Um, it's, again, it's not really that useful. I mean, you can use it if you want, but I rarely get very good results. You can basically leave everything by default, you don't really need to touch anything, unless you heavily use that option for some reason. You can, for example, increase the amount of the minimum description length, so that you get basically more details or more artists for the final prompt. But to be honest, I didn't find that this option works very well. And finally, you have the user interface. None of it is really interesting, except this one, the progress bar, uh, because I remember someone in my Discord uh, server saying that he liked to see basically the progress, the generation of the image on screen, kind of like it creates a new animation. And if you want to enable it, you can simply increase it to one. And this will basically create an animation when you create an image. So I'm going to show you right now. Just, you know, click apply settings. I'm going to go into my text to image. And here I'm just going to create a brand new image. I'm just going to take a prompt at random. Um, I'm going to take this one, for example, paste it here and then click on generate. And as you can see here, there is now a little animation of the image being created from scratch. And I'm just gonna leave it run until the end. And there you go. So you know, if you like this, you can leave it at one. I personally don't really care, so I'm just gonna put it at zero. So that's really up to you. Okay, so now let's talk about the three remaining tabs that we have right here, the text to image, image to image, and the extras. And let's start with the text to image, which is probably, you know, the tab that you know the most. So obviously here is when you put the prompt. Here, as I showed previously, is where you can add a random artist into the prompt. So this will create a brand new image using that artist style that you see right here. Here is the negative prompt. So this is where basically you can input any information that you don't want to see in the image. This is something that I showed you in the previous video also. If you remember the example that I showed you in the previous video, here's the original image, here's the negative prompt using the word purple, and it creates an image without the color purple, the negative prompt tentacles, so that it doesn't have any tentacles in the final image. So let's say for example that I don't want any grass, or I don't want any green, I'm just gonna input here, negative prompt green, press generate, so as you can see here, it did not work exactly as intended, since you can see a little bit of green, but it has less green than the previous image, so it's not that bad. But since it kind of goes against the style of the image that we wanted to create, since this is supposed to be a castle in a forest, trying to delete all the green is probably gonna be quite difficult, so that's probably why it did not work. But you can definitely try it out yourself, see what works, what doesn't. Just have fun with this, you know? So here the restore faces option is basically to use uh, either gfpgan or codeformer as we saw earlier in the settings tab. So if you want your final image to have a better face, I highly recommend you keep it checked. So the tiling checkbox basically creates a seamless texture that you can use for uh, texturing for example. I'm going to try to show you what it looks in the end. So this is what it looks like with the tiling option and if you take this image and you put this image into the seamless texture checker website, you can see here that this image is indeed a perfect seamless texture. You can increase the size and you can see that this texture it basically is perfect and you can use this for infinite texture, so it's pretty cool. So the iris fix is actually really cool because if you ever had pictures 
with like mut multiple heads or multiple images of the same character in the image, checking this box right here will basically get rid of the problem and eliminate all the extra heads that you might get if you increase the width or the height of the image. So that's a pretty cool fix. Here you can choose a random seed or reuse a seed from the previous generation. And then you have the script options here and you have the option to either choose a prompt from a file or a text box, a prompt matrix or an XY plot. So the prompts from file or text box is, well, kind of what it says and does. So as it says right here, you can simply upload the text file and it will read the prompts that are inside the text file. Now the prompt matrix file, I'm going to show you what it does. It creates basically this kind of grid image with all the different prompts written here on the left and on the top. So you can better see what words influence the final image in what way. And to do this, you need to separate the words that you want to see in the final image by a vertical sign character. So for example, you can see here in the example is a busy city street in a modern city, then vertical line, illustration, vertical line, cinematic lighting. And the result that you get is basically four different images. When you have a busy city with cinematic lighting, here you have a busy city with cinematic lighting and illustration. Here you have only a busy city and here you have a busy city illustration. So only by using two arguments here, it creates four different images. And the more arguments you use, the more images it will create. As you can see here, here's another example with five prompts in 16 different variations. So that's really useful if you want to study how stable diffusion works and what words influence the final image. So the XY plot creates a grid with different parameters that you can put right here. So as you can see here in the example, you have an initial prompt right here, portrait of Medusa Gorgona. Then you input the prompt SR with the values. Here they have chosen different artists to see the final results. And here they wanted to see if by increasing the scale by five each time, they wanted to see what kind of final image they could get. So with all of these parameters, this create this final image, this final grid image with all the different artists right here with that same exact prompt that you see here, the initial one. And for each additional scales by five, this creates a brand new image by using the word of the artist that you can see on top. It's a little complicated to explain, but I think you kind of see what kind of results you can get. Again, this is really useful if you want to study how stable diffusion works and what kind of results you can get with different words. Okay, so now let's proceed with the image to image tab. So here is where you actually upload the image that you want to use as a base. Here is when you interrogate and you can use the image to text option to try to understand how the image was generated. Well, at least in theory, because in practice it doesn't really work that well. Here you have three tabs, image to image, in paint and batch image to image. So image to image, you know, is when you transform an image into another one using the prompt right here. Batch image to image is the same. But this time it's multiple images at a time. The in paint, I've already shown it on a previous video, is where you basically create a mask on an image and then create a new image from that. For example, I'm gonna show you this one. Maybe I want to change her face. Maybe I want like a, I don't know, like a mustache. I'm gonna draw a mask here. So you can either draw directly on the image or upload a mask that you created somewhere else. So in paint mask, if this is selected, basically everything that you mask will be modified. If you check in paint not mask, it's basically everything else outside of the mask that will be modified. Obviously, since I want a mustache, I want what I mask to be modified. So the mask content fill basically fills with colors of the image. The original keep whatever was there originally. The latent noise fill it with latent space noise. And latent nothing fill it with latent space zeros. Basically look like this. This is the mask, this is the fill, this is the original, latent noise and latent nothing. So it doesn't really matter what you choose, it will be in painted anyway. So in paint a full resolution basically allows to kind of get a, a better image in the end. I'm just going to increase it for this one. So the, this, this one basically just resizes to the target resolution, but you might get incorrect aspect ratio. This one will basically crop the image that sticks out. And this one will fill with basically the image colors 
Now the sampling steps right here, I'm just gonna leave it at maybe, uh, let's take 75. So apparently DDIM is best at inpainting, so I'm gonna choose this one. I'm not gonna check restore faces or tiling. I'm gonna leave everything here by default and just click on generate. And there you go, here is the final result, which is not bad actually, it's a pretty good result. Um, still not as good as what you might get with DALI for example, but it will surely get better with time. But you know, this version of inpainting is free, so you can use it as much as you want, kind of try it, try it out a little bit, try to see what kind of results you can get. So it's always nice to have, you know, especially if you don't currently have access to DALI 2. Now here in the bottom, in the script option, you have a lot of options right here. Now we've seen some of them. We've seen the XY plot. The SD upscale is basically a simple upscaler. The prompt matrix, we've seen it. The prompts from file or text box, we've seen it also. Now we have here the poor man's alt painting and alt painting MK2. These are basically two different scripts that allows you to alt paint an image. And alt paint it basically creates a brand new image outside of the initial image that you created right here. So here, for example, this is the initial image. And this is the alt painting created with the script poor man's alt painting. And this is the same result with the same exact prompt with the alt painting MK2. So it doesn't work as well. Technically, the alt painted image actually looks better, but this one integrates the initial image way better. So it feels like if you want to have a better alt painting final image that integrates the initial one better, you might want to use the poor man's alt painting. Now you can play around a little bit with the uh, the options, the number of pixels to expand, the max blur, etc. Probably want to increase the max blur a little bit more, trying to see what works, what doesn't. The alt painting direction also, if you just want the, the left portion, the right, the up, down. So this is really nice to have. So the loop back option is actually pretty cool. Uh, it allows you to basically automatically feed the, the, the finished image back into stable diffusion so that it creates a brand new image. So for example here in the example, it started out with this crude drawing of that a, a bunny girl. This created a brand new image and using the loopback function, this image was then feed back again into the stable diffusion to create this image. That image was then feed again in stable diffusion to create this one and etc etc to finally create this final image right here. And here is where you basically choose the amount of loops you want, the amount of times you want your final image to be reintroduced into the cycle, and this is the, the, the noise and strength that you want on each loop. If you don't understand something, you can simply hover your mouse on the option and it will give you an explanation on what this option actually does. Finally, you have the image to image alternative test, now the image to image alternative test is kind of strange, I have to admit, uh, I never really managed to make it work, but basically it's supposed to make it easier to modify an initial image. Now there is a, a guide here on how you can use it, but I never really managed to get the result that I want. And basically, as you can see here, you have an initial prompt with that image that was reconstructed and then modified with different prompts. But to be honest, I tried to make it work and I just couldn't. So if you do manage to make it work, please let me know because I just don't really get the results that it says it does. And finally, we have the extra tab, which is pretty self-explanatory. It doesn't really have a lot of options. There is basically an upscaler and a face restorer. Here you can upload one image or in the batch process, process multiple images. Here you have your choices of upscaler. Again, as I said, you should probably use the real SR GAN or the plus anime one. These are the ones that I use most of the time. And here you have the visibility for the face restorer, GFP GAN and Codeformer. And as I said, Codeformer is probably the one that you want to use because it apparently creates better results. So I highly recommend you kind of play around a little bit and see what kind of results it does for you because it really depends on the kind of images that you have initially. So just play around a little bit and see what kind of final image you get. So here's a little troubleshooting session for all of you. So if you have any error with Python when you try to launch the web UI user.bat file, someone said in the comment that instead of clicking on the install now button, you should click on customize installation 
where you can choose the location and all the features of Python. And again, don't forget to check these two boxes right here, install Launcher for all users and add Python to path. This is very important. But if you have any problems, if you have any trouble, if you have any errors with Python that says that Python is not found or something like that, just click on Customize Installation, check every boxes and then install Python in the default folder. Now another issue, if you have a graphics card in NVIDIA in the 1600 series or if you just have black images, so one thing that you can do is right click on WebUI user.bat file, click on edit with notepad plus plus and here on set command lines ARGAS you can type dash dash precision full dash dash no half. Now this should solve any black images output but unfortunately it will also use more VRAM to produce the images so you can add another argument that we saw earlier on and that is dash dash med VRAM and then you can save the image. And this will basically cancel out the additional VRAM that this operation requires. And if it still again doesn't work, instead of putting made VRAM, you can use low VRAM and then save the file. Now, yes, again, this will take more time for each image generation, but you know, at least it will work. And there you have it, folks. You should now have a complete understanding of all the options and settings present in the Super Stable Diffusion 2.0. So if you like this video, don't forget to subscribe and smash the like button for the YouTube algorithm. And I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.